and welcome to Exploring Microgravity, brought to you by Space Florida. I'm Janet Ivey from Janet's Planet, and Space Florida has invited you and me on an out-of-this-world adventure to explore, experiment, and experience microgravity. Space Florida's goal is to encourage scientific investigation by young Earthlings everywhere, and to inspire the imaginations of the scientists, mathematicians, astronomers, astronauts, and space explorers of the future. And we're hoping that's you. I am here today at the Kennedy Space Center's Visitors Complex, where soon I will be blasting off in a Boeing 727 cargo aircraft to experience what astronauts experience when they are in space, microgravity. So as you watch this program, I want your mind to revolve around this thought. While you might not be able to take the flight with me today, there is a very good chance that in your lifetime, you will have the opportunity to buy a flight to the moon as easily as you buy a ticket for the bus. But before we talk about microgravity, let's find out what you know about gravity. Gravity is humongous and but you can't see it, so. Gravity is the force that pulls the center of two objects together. How cool is that? Gravity works by keeping us on the ground. Like when you throw a ball up in the air, it will come down. Without gravity, it will just float. Isaac Newton discovered gravity when an apple fell on his head. Isaac Newton definitely explained gravity, but he didn't really find it because it's been around for a long time. Gravity is a good thing. Gravity. Okay, do you mean like Gravite, the Australian rapper that only raps about kangaroos? Because that's like the only person that I know with that name. If we didn't have gravity, things would fall up instead of falling down. It also compacts trash and it helps landfills. And I think it's just very uh, helpful. Gravity is what keeps the planets from flying off into space. Those are some good answers and some very creative answers. But there seems to be some confusion about gravity. To get to the core of the issue, let's ask a scientist. Gravity is the force that is put on another body by a larger body. So we say, for example, you have the Earth. The Earth is a planet like Uranus, like Venus, like Saturn, like Jupiter, like all the other planets in the solar system. Now here on the Earth's surface, everybody's able to walk around, they can do their daily activities and all the other things. And we live in an atmosphere or an environment called 1G. And that's our standard, that's what we equate, or that's the equivalent, or everything that we compare everything else against. Now you take a smaller body in the solar system, something like our moon. Now the Earth's moon is one-sixth the size of the Earth. So therefore, the moon has one-sixth gravity of the Earth, or one-sixth G and then compare that again against Mars. Mars is one third the size of the Earth, so we have one third G. But that means on the lunar surface, compared to the Earth, you will weigh one sixth as much, and then on Mars, one third as much. Gravity is the force of attraction between all masses in the universe, especially the attraction of the Earth's mass for bodies near its surface. Gravity is an invisible pulling force between two objects. Here are some examples of how gravity affects us. If I jump as high as I can, I can only go so high because Earth's gravity pulls me down. If you jump on a trampoline, you will go up, but gravity pulls you back towards the trampoline. If you swing on a swing, you'll experience for a brief blink of time microgravity, but gravity is going to pull you and the swing back down towards the ground. Think about gymnasts, pole vaulters, or divers. They may go up, but Earth's gravity will always be there to pull them down. And the force of gravity between two objects depends on the masses of the two objects and the distance between the centers of the two objects. See, there's a gravitational force between you and Earth. There is also a gravitational force between you and the sun, between you and all the other planets, and between you and the people sitting next to you. But why do we fall down towards Earth rather than towards the sun, another planet, or the people next to us? Well, we don't fall towards the people next to us because they are much less massive than the Earth. Ah, but you might say the sun is way more massive than Earth. Why don't we fall towards the sun? 
because the sun is much farther away. As the distance between two objects gets larger, the gravitational force between them gets smaller. So we stay on the ground because the force of gravity between Earth and us is larger than the force from anything else. When you are standing on Earth with your toes buried in the dirt, it may seem like there isn't any distance between you and planet Earth but the distance is measured between the centers of two objects, not the edges. So the distance between you and Earth is the distance from the center of the Earth to about your belly button. So let's review. The more the masses of the objects, the larger the gravitational force between them. As the distance between two objects gets larger, the gravitational force gets smaller. And even when objects are at great distances from one another, gravity never quite gets to zero. It just may seem like there isn't any. Let's consider something. If the Earth's gravity were ever to change significantly, it would have a huge effect on everything. Could we survive without gravity? I mean, think about it. We depend on gravity to hold a lot of things down. Cars, people, furniture, pencils, paper on your desk, your cat, and even your hair. So let's imagine that one day somebody turned off planet Earth's gravity machine and suddenly no gravity. Everything not held in place would suddenly have no reason to stay down. Everything would start floating. And although it would be pretty awesome to be floating around, it would turn out actually to be a pretty bad day because it's not just couches and your dog Sammy that would start to float. Two of the most important things held by Earth's gravity are the atmosphere and the water and the oceans, lakes and rivers. Without gravity, the gas molecules in the atmosphere, you know them, water vapor, oxygen, nitrogen, argon, carbon dioxide, and trace amounts of other gases would have no reason to encircle Earth. <gasps> Finding a way to breathe would become a priority and figuring out how to outswim the swell of water rising up and away from Earth would be another concern. Anybody got an air tank or some scuba gear? See, this is the problem our moon has. The gravitational force the moon exerts is not strong enough to attract and retain significant quantities of atmospheric gases. And because our moon doesn't have enough gravity to keep an atmosphere around, it's in a near vacuum. Without an atmosphere, any living thing would die immediately. And anything liquid would float and bubble away into space. So as you can see, gravity is very important to our world and how we live. Time now for a little history lesson. Let me introduce you to chemist Henry Cavendish. How's it going, Henry? Fine, thanks. Henry is known for the Cavendish experiment. He was the first person to measure the force of gravity between masses in a laboratory and to produce an accurate value for the Earth's density. Correct. His work led to accurate values for the gravitational constant G. What's up, G? Yo. And the Earth's mass. The measurement of the gravitational constant allowed the mass of the Earth to be calculated for the first time. This also allowed the calculation of the masses of the sun, the moon, and the other planets. The first time this constant was used was in 1873, almost 100 years after the Cavendish experiment. Mm -hmm. Variations of Cavendish's results are still used today. Indeed. Now for this experiment, he used a device with a torsion balance like that, to measure the gravitational attraction between two 350 pound lead spheres and a pair of two inch 1.61 pound lead spheres. Using this experiment, Cavendish found that the Earth's average density is 5.48 times greater than that of water. It turns out that any two masses have a gravitational attraction for one another. If you put two bowling balls near each other, they will attract one another gravitationally. The attraction is extremely slight, but you could measure the attraction if you had the right equipment. From that measurement, you could determine the mass of the two bowling balls. The measurement of our planet's weight is derived from the gravitational attraction that the Earth has for objects near it. Cavendish performed his experiment in an outbuilding in the garden of his estate. For years afterward, his neighbors would point out the building and tell their children that this is where the world was weighed. Weight is a function of gravity. If I weigh 132 pounds on Earth, I'd only weigh 44 pounds on Mars and 22 pounds on the moon. 
My mass never changes. Only my perceived weight changes. Huh, you didn't get that? Do you speak alien? This guy is a little confused about the difference between weight and mass. Sure. He wants me to explain. <laughs> I don't mind. Mass is a measurement of how much matter is in an object. Weight is a measurement of how hard gravity is pulling on that object. Your mass is the same wherever you are, on Earth, on the moon, floating in space, somewhere near Pluto. Remember me? I remember you. Because the amount of stuff we're made of doesn't change. Later. But your weight depends on how much gravity is acting on you at the moment. You'd weigh less on the moon than on Earth, and in interstellar space, you'd weigh almost nothing at all. If you stay on Earth, gravity is always the same. So it would seem like it really doesn't matter whether you talk about weight or mass. But scientists still like to be careful about distinguishing between the two. If you talk about the mass of an object, it will always be the same no matter if it's on Earth or in space. But if you talk about an object's weight, that can change depending on gravity. Let me give you an example of weight. If I stand on this scale, I weigh 132 pounds. Now if I hold a 10-pound bag of potatoes, the scale says I am now 142 pounds. This bag of potatoes isn't a part of me, so I am not really heavier. But gravity has perceived a change in my mass. Or maybe just that I've possibly eaten 10 pounds of french fries. You see, gravity works on the whole object together, not just on one part. The extra gravity force registers as increased weight on the scale. This is getting heavy. I'm gonna drop a little mass. Whoops, mashed potatoes. <laughs> little science joke. Let's review again. The bigger the object's mass, the more gravity it will have, and the smaller the mass of the object, the less gravity. And the force of gravity depends on the distance between the centers of the two objects. The closer they are, the stronger the gravity will be. Now you may be asking, isn't Isaac Newton the guy that had a great idea all because he saw an apple fall? Oh. Supposedly, when Newton saw the apple fall, he began to think along the following lines. The apple must experience a change in velocity as it goes from just hanging on the tree to falling to the ground. Newton's second law states there must be a force that acts on the apple to cause it to become accelerated. Indeed. He calls this force gravity yeah. and the associated acceleration the acceleration due to gravity. That's right. Newton understood that gravity was the force of attraction between two objects. He also understood that an object with more matter or mass exerted the greater force or pulled the smaller object toward it. Yeah. That meant that the large mass of the Earth pulled objects toward it. That's why the apple fell down instead of up, and why people walk on the ground and don't float in the air. Then he imagined the apple tree twice as tall. Again, he expects the apple from the doubly tall tree to be accelerated toward the ground. Newton's idea suggests that this force that we call gravity reaches to the top of the tallest apple tree. Then came Sir Isaac Newton's most truly awesome idea. If the force of gravity reaches to the top of the highest tree, uh. might it not reach even further? Ew. What if gravity extended to the moon and beyond? Uh. Isaac calculated the force needed to keep the moon moving around the Earth. Then he compared it with the force that made the apple fall. After allowing for the fact that the moon is much farther from the Earth and has a much greater mass, he discovered that the forces acting on the apple and the moon were the same. Just as the apple is pulled to the ground by gravity, the moon is held in an orbit around Earth by the pull of Earth's gravity. Isaac Newton's calculations changed the way people understood the universe. No one had been able to explain why the planets stayed in their orbits. What held them up? Yeah. Less than 50 years before Isaac Newton was born, it was thought that the planets were held in place by an invisible shield. That is correct, yes. Isaac proved that they were held in place by the sun's gravity. That's right. He also showed that the force of gravity was affected by distance and by mass. Newton really didn't discover gravity oh. as much as he found a way of explaining it. 
Isaac Newton thought the universe worked like a machine and that a few simple laws governed it. Yes. He realized that mathematics was the way to explain and prove those laws. Indeed. Isaac Newton was one of the world's greatest scientists because he took his ideas and the ideas of earlier scientists and combined them into a shared picture of how the universe works. So with everything I've told you about gravity, what might we observe if we were to do normal activities in space or in microgravity. If I open a package of candy and begin to just let them fall, they will end up on the ground, which is really uncool because I like chocolate and now I can't eat them because they're on the ground. What would a handful of candy do in microgravity? If I spill water out of my water bottle, I either get my cameraman wet or because of gravity, it falls to the ground. How would spilled water from my water bottle react in microgravity? On Earth, I can do a few push-ups. I could maybe even do a push-up with someone sitting on me. Ah, or not. How many push-ups do you think I could do in microgravity? Maybe even finger push-ups in microgravity. If I drop this feather and this hammer at the same time on Earth, which will land first? Why? What happens when I drop a feather and a hammer on the moon? It was the famed astronomer Galileo whose study of gravity spawned the legendary tale of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, Feather Drop. <laughs> Galileo Galilei was an Italian physicist, astronomer, and philosopher. He was associated with the scientific revolution. Z. In the late 16th century, it was generally believed heavier objects would fall faster than lighter objects. Galileo thought differently. He hypothesized or imagined that two objects could fall at the same rate regardless of their mass. Z. Legend has it that in 1590, Galileo held a feather and a stone in either hand and released them simultaneously. The feather structure slowed its descent in parachute fashion, and the stone landed first. Mm. Galileo reasoned that this was a result of factors other than weight, and his later investigations confirmed that air resistance and friction, not weight, are responsible for this difference. What would happen if you dropped a feather and a stone on the moon where no air exists? Astronauts David Scott and Jim Irwin conducted Galileo's experiment on the moon during their Apollo 15 mission. Take a look at what happened. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Uh, that proves that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. See. The Apollo feather drop was not the most accurate science experiment. Mm. No one measured the height from which the objects were released, nor the time they took to fall, and Scott was leaning over with his arms not quite parallel to the ground. Mm. But as a demonstration, it is unforgettable. See. And so too is Galileo. Quick, name three scientists who have furthered the world's understanding of gravity. Let's put them in order. Galileo built on the ideas of the scientists who came before him. Newton built on the ideas of Galileo. And Cavendish built on the ideas of Newton and Galileo. Thank you. Let your mind revolve around this. If I have seemed further than others, it is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. As we move forward in time, which of you will stand on the shoulders of these science giants and increase our understanding of gravity and microgravity? All right, after everything we have learned about gravity, what do you know about microgravity? Microgravity is itty bitty. Microgravity, I guess it would be like little gravity. Maybe just a little bit of keeping you down. Microgravity 
It's a very small gravity. Wherever you are in the uh, universe, there's always a little bit of gravity, and that's microgravity. Microgravity is super, super small. Like, when you order the extra large fry at a restaurant, it's the exact opposite of that. It's like the really tiny, tiny fry. But it's gravity, so it's like a super tiny fry of gravity. It's really small. It's like super small. Super small. Microgravity is gravity in space. There's little of it. That's why it's called microgravity. You just float all around. Micro means little, so, and since we know what gravity means, if you put them together, it means little gravity. I forgot this guy's name. His last name's Armstrong. Microgravity is what astronauts experience in space. Very good. I still think, just to clarify, we should go ask a scientist. When you have astronauts in orbit, they are going through an environment in what we call microgravity. Now, microgravity doesn't mean no gravity. Microgravity means a very small amount of gravity. And one of the reasons for this is that when you are on the Earth's surface, you have one G or one gravity. But the further away you get from the Earth, the pull of the Earth's gravitational field gets less and less and less. So when you get into orbit, 100 miles, 200 miles above the sur surface of the Earth, the gravitation of the field of the Earth is small, but it's not nothing. So that's why we call it microgravity as opposed to zero gravity. Microgravity is a term used by scientists to mean very little gravity. The effects of gravity aboard an orbiting spacecraft like the Space Shuttle or at the International Space Station are reduced significantly compared to what we experience here on Earth, which is why astronauts are able to float around so easily. The micro in microgravity is a common prefix used in science to mean one millionth. The symbol for the word micro, or 10 raised to the power of minus six, is this. And the symbol for microgravity is this. The reason scientists prefer to use the term microgravity instead of zero G is that no matter where an object is in the universe, there will always be a little bit of gravity acting upon it. Besides astronauts, people experience microgravity every day by riding roller coasters or jumping off diving boards. It is the free fall period of these activities when the microgravity occurs and of course only lasts for a short, short period of time. Here's a coin. When I toss it up in the air, I have just subjected that coin to microgravity. From the time it leaves my hand until I catch it, it is experiencing microgravity. The time in microgravity might be one to two seconds depending on how high I toss the coin. For extended periods of microgravity, say longer than a second or two, certain special conditions have to be present. Drop towers typically offer about five seconds of microgravity and parabolic flight, like the one I'm about to go on, offers about 25 seconds of microgravity. Let me give you an example of what would happen in a drop tower that you most likely have experienced, an elevator. Suppose I was standing on a scale in an elevator that's at the top of a skyscraper. I would see on the scale that my weight is 132 pounds. Now suppose somebody cuts the elevator cable. What will I see on the scale in my free fall down the elevator shaft? Ah! Now before you answer that, take a moment to look at what's happening. Ah! The elevator floor is falling, the scale is falling, I'm falling, everything is falling. Ah! So to say it as simply as I can, Anytime you are able to move freely in response to gravity, meaning that there is nothing to restrain you from accelerating or decelerating, you are weightless or experiencing microgravity. For longer durations of microgravity, we must devise more sophisticated freefall methods. Remember me talking about Isaac Newton? He helped us understand that the further an object is away from the Earth, 
the less it will be attractive. The trick to achieving weightlessness is to propel an object using a rocket engine with an initial velocity parallel to Earth's surface, while at the same time allowing the object to fall freely. In this way, the object will be in continuous free fall, but will never hit the Earth. It will become in orbit with the Earth. At a particular velocity, the trajectory of the object becomes a circle, and this is known as a circular orbit around the Earth. If microgravity affects objects so differently in space than on Earth, what do you think microgravity does to the human body? Space sickness is one effect of microgravity. About 40% of astronauts vomit in the early days of a mission. Vomiting any time isn't fun, much less in space. Remember, everything floats. Yikes. On Earth, we need legs to move and walk. In weightlessness, you use your hands to move around. During the first few days in space, an astronaut's face gets puffy, and an astronaut's legs become smaller because the muscles of the legs force blood and other fluids toward the upper part of the body, decreasing the normal measurement of an astronaut's thighs and calves. These changes produce a bird leg effect. Astronauts also grow one to two inches taller. This is because in microgravity, the spine lengthens and straightens, and the discs between the vertebrae expand and decompress slightly, depending on how much an astronaut weighs. The lower back muscles don't stretch quickly and make enough room for the spine lengthening, so the result is a painful backache. Astronauts' bones get weaker in space because calcium and other minerals are lost from bone mass whenever it's not being pulled on by gravity, so their bones get weaker. We call that decalcification. The concern is not so much for short missions, but what would happen to an astronaut's body on a long-term mission to Mars? The heart muscle might have decreases in heart pumping power after long duration missions. What kind of problems could that cause? Huh? Don't leave without me. I have been having so much fun telling you about gravity and microgravity that pff, I almost forget what I'm really here to do. Fly in zero G's Boeing 727 and experience microgravity. Well, now it's time to go through security and board the plane. This is so exciting, but I have to tell you something. Can you come a little closer? I'm a little scared. Yep, a little freaked out. They just said that we're going to be doing 15 parabolas. Parabola, parabola. What's that again? What happens on a parabola is we fly a parabolic flight is what it's called in a plane. And this parabolic flight is the only way here on Earth that we are able to simulate or replicate microgravity. So people talk about space chambers, zero gravity chambers. None of those exist here on Earth. They are only in the movies. So the only way that we can train astronauts to experience microgravity is a parabolic flight. A parabola is the pattern that the plane is going to fly in the air. Now you know if you go to Disney, if you go to Universal Studios, if you go onto a roller coaster anywhere in the world, you are experiencing something or a similar sensation to what you will get on a parabola. So when you get a roller coaster and it goes over the very, 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 very top and it starts to come down again, just at that point where it comes over the top and begins to drop and you feel yourself drop. That is something kind of similar to what you will experience on a parabolic flight. So we do the same thing in the big 727. We get the plane, it flies out over the ocean, and then what happens is the pilot directs it up in the air like this. So the plane is going to fly in this type of motion through the air. Now the difference between actually flying the plane and doing a parabolic flight is this that just before the plane gets to this point in the sky, just before it goes over the crest of the wave, what they will do is they will reverse the engines. So essentially what a parabolic flight means is as we go through this pattern in the sky, that the plane, instead of actually flying over the top of the wave, it actually falls over the top of the wave. And what happens in the plane is the plane actually falls, but everything else in the plane falls at the exact same rate on the exact same speed as the plane. So the plane is falling, you are falling, everything is falling at the same rate, but you actually feel like you're floating. And that's exactly what happens in orbit around the Earth, that you aren't actually floating 
in space. You are actually falling at a constant speed towards the surface of the earth that actually makes you feel like you are weightless. This is my official zero knot boarding pass, which means I'm going to fly in zero G in just moments from now. I'm official, I am a zero knot. And now it's time to actually board the plane. And we are about to find out what happens when we are in microgravity. Weightlessness is achieved by flying G-Force 1 through a parabolic flight maneuver. Specially trained pilots fly these maneuvers between approximately 24,000 and 34,000 feet altitude. Each parabola takes 10 miles of airspace to perform and lasts approximately one minute from start to finish. The actual weightlessness experience lasts about 20 to 25 seconds. On the first parabola, everyone aboard experiences Martian gravity, which is one third the Earth's gravity. Wow, totally with my fingertips. Look at this. On the second parabola, we experience lunar gravity, which is one sixth the Earth's gravity. This is what Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin felt when they were on the moon. It's just a sixth of the Earth's gravity, and you can hop and float. Oh, wow. Hippity hoppity, hippity hop, over hill and hill. On the third parabola, we again experience lunar gravity. This time, we're going to exhibit superhuman strength by doing pyramid push-ups. And now, it's time to experience microgravity. Unbelievable! It's like being a balloon that's just gotten filled with helium. On this parabola, I release a feather, a stone, and a hammer, and they float in microgravity. On this parabola, see what happens when I release candy in microgravity. Mm, good. On this parabola, see what happens when I release water from my water bottle in microgravity. In microgravity, water forms spherical globules. On this parabola, look at me as a human ball. Observe the action and reaction and the transfer of momentum. On this parabola, I used my super microgravity powers and flew like Superman. I feel such joy right now. I am so blessed to have this experience. Being in weightlessness, zero G, and microgravity is like being on the best roller coaster in the entire universe. Space provides an environment that is absolutely unique. Prolonged microgravity cannot be duplicated anywhere on Earth. We experienced microgravity aboard the Zero-G Boeing 727, but only for about 25 seconds at a time. Wow, microgravity is mind-boggling and one of the coolest things I have ever experienced. Let's review what we've learned. Gravity is a force that governs motion throughout the universe. It holds us to the ground, keeps the moon in orbit around the Earth, and keeps Earth in orbit around the sun. The bigger the object's mass, the more gravity it will have, and the smaller the mass of the object, the less gravity. And the force of gravity depends on the distance between the centers of the two objects. The closer they are, the stronger the gravity will be. Microgravity means very little gravity. It's as close to zero gravity as we can ever be. Microgravity is also referred to as weightlessness and zero G, and parabolic flight is the only way to create sustained weightlessness without going into space. The International Space Station, the Moon, Mars, Jupiter, they are out there waiting. And although you may not believe it now, you and your friends will be the generation to explore and inhabit them. Will you be ready? What will your first mission be? Where will you live? How will you check your email or send a text message from parts yet unexplored in the universe? Remember, what we can dream, think, or imagine today just might be great science tomorrow.
Space Florida and I hope you have enjoyed this journey of investigation of gravity and microgravity. And although you didn't experience microgravity with me today, don't for a second believe that it won't possibly be a future experience for you. Each and every one of you are the shining stars of the future of space exploration, science, and astounding discoveries. Space Florida and I want you to get excited and curious about the stars and planets and what's really up and out there. Let your mind revolve around this thought. The universe is always expanding. Let your mind do the same. And that's The View from Janet's Planet. Space Florida, the launching pad for young Earthlings to be the scientists, mathematicians, astronomers, astronauts, and space explorers of the future. Paid for in part by Nash of the Nashville Predators. <laughs>